In this video, I'm going to go over how to make the sliding lid portion of the box. I'm just going to assume for the sake of this video that you know how to make a mitered box, so I'm not going to go over that. I'm just going to go over how to do the grooves, how to make the lid, choose the right lid, and how to do this front piece. I will say off the bat, this is a very long video. It's very detailed. If you're looking for a five minute tutorial, this is probably not for you. However, if you've never done this before or if you're struggling with it, give this video a watch, see if there's anything that uh, helps you out there, and uh, let me know if you have any questions or anything else you want to see about this box. Now when it comes to lids, we have to make some decisions. This is the box I'm currently working on. We have a couple different methods for choosing a lid. The first is to take a solid piece of wood that's slightly larger than what we will need and to plane it down uh, and just create a solid piece of wood lid. That's an okay option. The wider your box gets, you deal with a little more cupping, twisting possible. You can take a single piece of wood, resaw it into two, and have a book match lid. I really like this. It's a cool option and it conserves wood. You just have to make sure that you buy a piece of wood thick enough to start that you can resaw it. Either table saw or bandsaw resaw can get you a nice book match. We also have the option of making a panel and taking two separate pieces of wood, perhaps from the same board, and gluing them together like this. If you do, enough, uh, do a good enough job with your glue line, they will essentially appear to be a single piece of wood. And here's another example of a piece of wood that uh, I will eventually resaw down into two separate lids. So any of those methods can be used to make great lids. Now they all have some upsides and downsides. When it comes to this kind right here, it really helps to find a board ahead of time that's relatively flat when you get it from the lumber yard. This is not too bad. With a jointer or a planer sled, we'll be able to get this fairly flat, which makes for a good lid. With this, with the more figure and highly uh, detailed grain you get, you can get a little more problem when you resaw something. You can get some twist, you're releasing the internal pressure, so that can be a problem. And when you go for the book mat, you can get the same thing. This was a very nice flat piece of wood before. It has a nice big twist now. So when I resaw, I leave enough left that I can rejoint these with my planer sled and get them down to relatively flat. When you're gluing up two separate pieces of wood, you generally have a better chance, in my opinion, of getting something that's relatively flat after the glue up that can be finished with just sanding as long as you pay attention to how the boards are moving themselves. If you don't have a planer or a jointer, this is generally the easier way to do it other than this, other than the single piece. The panel glue up is better. It just takes a little time to match. Some people believe you should alternate the grain. Um, I haven't really found a significant difference in outcome. If you've got twisted, cupped, warped boards, alternating the grain or not is still gonna be a problem. Um, so do that at your own risk and don't think that that's necessarily going to save you. I just wanted to show you an example of what I mean by a heavily twisted lid that is sort of unusable for this. I resawed it and I made a nice book match. I just, I love this thing. But when it glued up, it has a gigantic twist to it. There's not enough left on here uh, after gluing up really to joint it again. So for all intensive purposes, this is no longer able to be used for a sliding lid. It's just way too much of a twist. If your lid after making it comes out like this, uh, you're gonna have a real hard time getting the lift to sit flat. Now this is an example of a lid that will work that is relatively cupped. We got a lot of movement back and forth here. This is another resawn lid from a, a maple tree that actually fell in a neighbor's yard. Now, the reason this works is because these sides will still ride up against evenly on the rails coming out of the box. It doesn't matter if it's a little low or a little high. That will come into play when we make the groove for the front lip, but it's easy to deal with. As long as these two sides that are riding in and out are both touching the bottom of the rail, and it can be either way, as long as they're both touching, that's fine. It still works. Now, when we're making these lids, whether we're just going to plane down a, a single piece of wood, resaw and glue, or panel glue, uh, if you have a planer, that really helps. However, I, in the past, before I ever got a planer, would router sled uh, things like this. I would just hot glue them to a piece of MDF and had a janky router sled, and I would just go through it. 
all the way down until it was relatively flat. And that worked fine, it was just uh, a ton of work. What we're gonna wanna do as we're making these to try to get it as close to flat as possible is you're going to wanna use your planer sled, if you have one, to joint one side first. Then you will put a straight edge on it, resaw it, and then I highly suggest just letting these pieces sit overnight. If we're gonna do it from a solid piece of wood, joint one side, flatten the other side by obviously putting it through the planer again, and then you'll want to take off um, an evenish amount from both sides and go to within maybe leave a quarter inch or so left from your final size and let it sit overnight. Uh, I really don't suggest going right from the planer uh, or even the router sled to making your box lid. It really helps to leave them sit overnight and then check again in the morning uh, or the next day or even in a week, whatever, because often they will get a little janky again, especially if you're resawing and you've released a bunch of internal tension. Even with these, you can release internal tension and you wanna give yourself the ability to joint it again. Um, obviously, you can use a hand plane for all of this too. I, I just am not a hand plane person. I'm gonna assume for the sake of this video that you know how to make a miter box or some kind of box-like shape. And the key to the sliding lid is choosing a side where we're gonna cut out a section of this. Depending upon the box size, I like to go between half an inch to seven eighths of an inch, and we're gonna cut that off of there. Now, you have two options when you cut this off. Either make this front piece taller so that you can slide down and use it as the top of the lid and get a relatively close match, or make sure you have another piece of wood that matches well with the grain below. If you want the best match, you have to think about this ahead of time so that you're not stuck with a great piece of wood down here and one that does not match at all for this right here. Uh, with this one, I've got another piece that matches well, so I'm not too concerned about starting this taller. Now to do our sliding lid, we're going to essentially need to do what I've done for the base here, and we'll get done to the top. You're gonna need to cut a groove. On a miter uh, box, this is pretty simple in that you can just run it through the router table. If you've used box joints or something else, and you don't wanna have to do plugs, you need to do a plunge cut either on your table, uh, your router table, or with your, uh, plunge base router. I've seen people do it on the table saw. I'm not a fan, that seems really sketchy to me, but there are people who do it on the table saw by essentially lowering it onto the blade, pushing, and then coming up like that. Now the key here is we're gonna take note ahead of time of what has happened to our piece of wood as we have decided on our lid. Is it cupping? Is it twisting? What's the deal? And that's gonna determine how wide or how deep we need to make this lid groove. Now, in my experience, a flat piece of wood or a cupped piece of wood for the lid are the two you can work with. If you get a really bad twist, it's going to be very hard to get the front lip to sit flush. A cup or a totally flat is really the ideal. Either one of them can work just fine. Now, ahead of time, if you think you may have any problems with your lid, whether it's this, a panel, or a single board having a cup, you're gonna to need to pay attention to the back piece because sometimes you wanna make the groove on there slightly lower so that the lid can ride up into it without hitting on there. Now, sometimes you can take the back of the lid and just round over the back pretty much uh, so that it rides itself up into there, but it's never a bad idea to make the back of the box a little lower or even a little higher if you want, but generally, uh, you want it to have room for the lid to slide up into it. That's a, a problem solving tip that you have to think about ahead of time, which is why I often think it's really good to have your lid made before you go and cut this top groove, not only for getting the general thickness right for knowing your lid, but to determine whether you need to make the back a little thicker. Now, something I'm personally a little obsessed with is having the front lip of my box almost disappear. I want as thin of a line as possible so that when you're looking at the box, you almost can't tell where the lid lip side is and where it isn't. Now to do this, I often use gravity to my advantage. And so the reason we want either a cup or a flat board is when we cut this groove here, the lid will ride on these two outside, actually these two outside edges as it's coming out right on here. And you want it touching the bottom of the front so that gravity is keeping it down. That allows for you to have when the lid goes in, a slight ride up, and I'll show this a little later in the video, so that the gravity locks the lid down itself. This is just a personal thing. I get a little obsessed with this. Some people don't care. So I'm just going through and gluing up my lid right now. This is a, a Resan one. Um, I just have a kind of a janky setup. I don't really have any expensive 
um, bar clamp. So I just kind of throw everything at it, a couple calls on either side. And really what we're looking for here is to get this as flat as possible. I like to use this underside backer board. I think it's just three quarter inch MDF to bring it up higher on these clamps. I've noticed that these clamps have a weird um, kind of force angle where if you let them sit really low with a, a smaller lid, it wants to kind of push them. So if you can bring them up as close to the middle as possible, I personally think you get a, a flatter lid coming out generally. With this backer board, I have it covered in packaging tape. Um, it will stick to the MDF, obviously, if you do not have something on there. So packaging tape is a nice cheap way. Uh, whatever that white laminated board they sell at Home Depot uh, supposedly doesn't stick glue to it. So that may be a good option. Um, but just make sure you put something on this that won't stick to glue or else you will have an MDF and wood lid. We should, we should have a pretty good amount left as well to plane off for the final lid thickness too. I like to shoot in the end for about 5 sixteenths. Uh, thickness for the lids anywhere between a quarter inch and three eighths is fine um, but you don't want a super heavy lid uh, to slide in and out and I find five sixteenths to be a nice um, kind of even middle ground I've gone as low as a quarter inch when I really had to, to save a lid by taking off a lot to kind of rejoint it and it's fine but uh, you know as long as your glue line is well you're never gonna break your lid uh, at the glue line I'll try to save as much material on there as possible but get your lid made and we'll go from there. So I've let the lid sit overnight. We're gonna take the clamps off and see if we lucked out and have something that's either flat or has a slight cup and is usable. So we got really lucky. Uh, there is the slightest cup, but this is actually extremely flat and I'm very happy with this. So we'll continue using this lid. I'm gonna run it through the planer just to get some of this glue off, take it down to final size. We're gonna to wanna to go down to between 5 sixteenths and 3 eighths. And part of this will depend on how tall your box is. Using a very short box, maybe somewhere even between a quarter inch and 5 sixteenths is better because it'll save you some inner space. Now that I've run this through the planer and we're getting close to final size, I wanna do most of my sanding on this lid now. I'm personally gonna to go to 320 grit. Uh, sometimes I stop at 220 and then do the 320 uh, at the very end in case I scratch it at all. Obviously many people don't have a planer. I didn't for years. So you can definitely sand this down flat. Uh, it's easier to scrape the glue with the back of a chisel or a card scraper or something instead of trying to sanding at it and gumming up your sanding paper. But this is also a nice time to get an early look at what the lid's gonna look like. This isn't a perfect book match, but it's, you know, it's not bad, it's pretty close. I'm a really big fan of using mineral spirits as a way to get a peek at what our lid's gonna look like or what our box is gonna look like. It dries incredibly fast. It gets pretty close to uh, what a finish will look like. So now that I can look at this, I can start to decide which way I want this lid to go. Now I'm thinking this will be the front because we've got a general angling in here. So that gives me a good idea then to get my box out and start looking at how that's gonna go. And next we're gonna go to our box after we've sanded this down and we're gonna start laying out our groove size. Now that we've got our lid sanded almost all the way, we're going to trim off the edges and square this up just a little bit. When sanding oftentimes, especially with the random orbit sander, you roll over the edges a little bit and that will uh, really mess with our cutting of grooves because eventually we're gonna cut this lid down to perfect size to fit. And if these edges are smaller than say a half inch in, our groove is suddenly gonna be a lot tighter than we really want it to be. So just go through and just take a little bit off on each side and then just square these up on the end there. Now, if you have a book match lid or for whatever reason you want uh, the center glue line in the center and you've done a really good job of hiding it, uh, I suggest you know keeping track on the end or making a mark as to where it is so that when you're taking off, you take off an equal amount from both sides. So again, just to skim pass on either side here at the table saw square this up and then we'll go from there. So now we're gonna lay out where our lid groove is going to go. Uh, I like to label these all ahead of time so I know. And for this lip on the bottom, this is only 330 seconds, which is the minimum I suggest you go with, but I like to do an eighth of an inch or so for the top. Um, obviously the smaller the box you get, uh, the less room you're gonna have inside, the more you inset the lid. And I really like to do this with these Incra Essentially, it's a marking gauge with a pencil that has marks even for the 64s. So, you know, we just go to an eighth of an inch and we're just going to map this out. 
And what you want to make sure is that it carries over a little bit onto this side so that when we're lining it up with the table saw or router bit, we can really see exactly where we're going. And you don't even have to do the whole thing, but as long as you've got the side you're going to feed into the table saw marked on the end, you're fine. I only mark this on one of the boards and then I just, you know, do them all in a row. Now what we're going to do is we're going to make a rough mark of where our lid's going to go. So we're going to take our top, we're going to make sure it's up. We're just going to set it on there and just kind of roughly line it up with the line and just make a mark on the other side. Now this, we're gonna end up making this wider than the lid actually is, or thicker, I guess you could say. So we just want a rough idea of where we're gonna start. So after sanding this down, we wanna get the bottom mark to again, give us some idea of where to go. And this is a hair uh, over 5 16 So I ended up marking obviously the first one at 1 8 and then the second one at 29 64 But anywhere uh, in that area is fine uh, for the thickness of the lid because when we go through the router, Remember, we've carried this over. We're gonna have the thin side closest to the fence so that we can go down. We want to make sure our top groove is at exactly an eighth of an inch so we can ensure that the router is cutting into it by moving down instead of moving bottom up. I think that's the easiest way to make sure you're always at an eighth of an inch here and then we can go down into the lid. And the reason we do that is because, you know, we're going to test fit as we go and we want to be able to keep moving a little further down if we need to. Uh, if you start from the bottom and go up, you're going to run out of room to keep going up or you're going to have to come and route against the grain going down the other way. So it's easier to go down uh, than it is to go up. So this one needs to be exactly where we want. And then this one is just a rough idea. So we're setting up the router table now to do this groove cut. And remember, you can absolutely do this on the table saw. And it may honestly be easier for some people, but if you're gonna do it on the table saw, you need an actual flat tooth grind blade, and I don't have one. Most combination blades, they have a single raker tooth in there that is flat, but it often isn't perfectly aligned with the tips of the alternating bevel ones, and so it will not leave a perfectly flat uh, bottom. I like to use an upcut spiral bit for this because upcuts leave a cleaner bottom of the groove, uh, downcuts leave a cleaner top, which is why on plywood, for instance, a downcut may be a better option. But we want the inside of the groove really clean here so that we get a good slide. And because my lid is about 5 16 I'm going to start with a quarter inch bit. You could go to a 5 16 if you have one because we're going to be going a little larger than our actual lid size. Now for doing these, I like to have the smallest opening insert in there. The router table is totally unplugged right now uh, because we want to prevent anything possible of our smaller front pieces or back pieces from tipping. So we want the smallest one in there. And what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna bring this up so that we are at a height of zero. And we wanna start at zero. I like to use my ruler here and just go back and forth till I touch a little bit, then a bit back down. And uh, depending upon your router lift or your fixed router base, uh, you can do this as well. And then this all here, I'll turn on this Craig one. And again, this will be different depending upon what you do uh, to zero. And then we'll bring it up to a 16th of an inch in order to help align. Uh, on a table saw, you can have uh, the same basic premise, just bring it up enough that you can align with your marks, if you're on a table saw, let's just pretend you've marked this out and you know your groove is going here, I'd continue the line down. Uh, and well, not entirely down, obviously, we don't want a bunch of pencil on here that's hard to get off, but put your square on here and mark on the very bottom. So we'll follow our line down and mark on the very bottom here where it is so that you can line it up this way to get a better mark and then you know when you're turning it over that you're lined up properly. On the router table, you can do it underneath like this. Now that we've got our bit raised about a 16th of an inch, I'm hoping you can see this. We're gonna get our router bit close here and I like to set this up just slightly on top. We want our bit so that it's facing on its width. That way we know the widest amount we're gonna get and how far this is towards there. We're gonna set it just on top of there. We're gonna bring the fence up now let's put it just a hair under that 1 8 inch mark. No more, just a slight hair under there so that we can move up just a little bit if we have to but so that we're not over cutting that 1 8 and we'll lock that in there and that looks pretty good. 
Now I'm not going to show you a whole lot of this because routers are very loud and I really have no idea how to turn sound down on a video. So I'm just going to show you a bit of the first pass. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise the bit slowly and we're going to make all of our depth on this with leaving this in the same spot. We want to get the depth correct and established with the exact same distance from the top. Remember, we're going to have the top of the lip in here and then we're going to go back. We're going to push this back as we go. So I'll probably go a quarter of an inch for this one. See how that looks. A quarter inch deep. And then what I like to do is lower the bit back again as we push back. You can try and take that whole quarter off, a uh, quarter inch off again, and you're only going to be nibbling away. But I have had some tear out before on Walnut, and it can really ruin a project. So safer than sorry, uh, which is something really nice about this Craig, is that you can set it to zero so that you can guarantee you're always back at the same height. Uh, you can also do this with a setup block or honestly just putting it over there and kind of moving it back and forth until you hear it just barely scrape. One thing I like to do before doing this is marking each of the boards with lid in so that I always know that I want the lid side into the fence. Eventually your sizes of these may get pretty similar at which point it becomes very hard to tell uh, quickly which side is which. One last thing you can do to really test whether this is lined up right is set the edge of the board over the router bit and just press it a bit. And you'll be able to turn it over and see two little indentations from the router bit uh, as to where it is and give you a really good idea. Just press it enough to indent it. So we've made that first pass. We can still see just a little bit of our line here, which means we're exactly where we want to be. So now that we've got our first pass done and we're all the way down to our final depth, we do not want to touch this upper side of this edge again. I would actually suggest taking a second pass at your final height just to make sure this is nice and clean in here. And we'll take our lid and just kind of get a place it up against the end there and get a general idea of where we're going. Looks like my measurement initially was almost spot on. So we're going to now take off uh, this next amount to the line and we'll get to there. And we'll see where we're at because we're eventually going to go a little lower so we can just we know we can take off down to this line now on our second go and you know it takes longer but i still like to go up a sixteenth of an inch at a time you could try to take all of that off and one to pass at a quarter inch but i have had blowout on some walnut before so you know i just became uh safer than sorry by going up a little bit at a time to take off this next final amount we know that the router bit spins in this way right which is why we started with the shallow side in, so that as we go back with this, it's going to spin into our new cut. It would be dangerous and possibly kick back to go back out. Remember, we're gonna just go back with this a little bit at a time until we line it up, right? We're just gonna go back. We don't wanna go forward, we wanna go back. So after going down to the line, I ended up going about another 64th an inch or so, maybe even a little less down again. And really what you're looking for is you're going down each time. You want to test the fit. You don't want any binding at all. You want to have a little wiggle room left and right, up and down. And the most important one is this back. You want to have whatever side your lid up is going to be. And you're going to want to put it in the back. And you're going to want to make sure you can see some sunlight, daylight, between the entire thing. Especially if you have a cup. You want to make sure that the cup of this in the middle if you're going cup up is not pushing heavily against the top if you've got it cupping the other way you want to make sure that the two wings that are coming up are not hitting against the top the key to a sliding lid box is that as we go in and out we don't want any friction from the top we want the base or the lid just sliding entirely on the base of this groove here it will really help in terms of going in and out and how your lid front sits Remember, the big key for this is that I want my lip that I end up putting on this to sit flush with the box or as close as possible. So if we're getting any pressure from the top, it's going to push this lid up as we go back in, which is going to destroy our ability to get it flush. So I want to give you guys a really up close look at what kind of gap I'm talking about here to get good action. Now identify the top of your lid, identify the back. This is the back piece to your box and slide this in there and I hope you can see this well, but we're looking for a black gap here. Eyeball this lid at about 90 degrees, how it's gonna be sitting. 
and look for a gap all the way across. You want to be able to wiggle it just a little bit so that if it does cup uh, more or less over time, you still have room to slide in there. Now, if you do have a cup, also pay attention to which side you're cupping here. If we're cupping up, and this is the height of the cup, you need to make sure there's still a gap in the middle here. If you're cupping the other way, you need to make sure that your wings aren't touching here with a gap in the middle. If there's anything touching, you need to go deeper. Uh, you, it's just, you have to go deeper. And of course, that'll prov uh, provide more room down here for your cup to rest lower, or conversely, more room up here. We're leaving this alone, and you just go deeper that way. And I suggest then doing that uh, with your sides as well. Just make sure there's a nice consistent gap all the way across. It's not really even noticeable at all uh, from the top. And this is one of the problems if you have a big twist is that on either opposite end, one side will almost always be touching and the other won't. Um, I just, that's why I don't use heavily twisted lids. I just consider them uh, unusable for these boxes. But if you're dead set on it, you just have to go quite a bit deeper so that everything is sitting on the bottom here. We don't want friction pushing on this side at all. I'm gonna glue this up, sand the insides, glue this up, and then when that's dry, we'll go from there. Now that we've got our glue up all done, we're gonna to wanna to go through and we're gonna do 90% of our sanding. Uh, if you need to flatten the box out on the bottom or top, do that. Sand up to your second to last grit on all the sides. Clean up the glue if you need to fill in any gaps because when we make this front piece, we want this as close to the ending thickness as possible to, in order to determine how thick our front piece is when we cut it, plane it, sand it, etc. Uh, but we don't want to go entirely to our last grip because at the very end we will have this front piece in there with the lid and do the sanding on front so they're nice and flush. Now that we've got this sanded to our second to last grip, including this top part, which is important, we're going to take our lid and we're going to kind of look at it and decide what we want to be the final part we see here. Now for myself, this is book match, so I'm just going to cut an even amount off of each side, but you may have a different grain orientation that you want. So get an idea of the distance between these two openings. I'm at about eh, six and three quarters of an inch. So I'm gonna get this down to about seven inches to a look I like, and then we're gonna slowly nibble off of this to get a nice fit into here. You want to make sure that we're taking it so that there's a little bit of play left and right. You really don't want a perfectly tight fit because this will expand a little bit. And also when we cut this front piece, we may not have it perfect. And we want to allow the front piece to align itself, which may require the lid shifting a little bit in the back of the front. Your glue up may not have been perfect. These may not be at perfect 45s. So we really want to allow for a little wiggle room in there. So now that we've got our width determined, and remember we want a little wiggle room left and right, we're going to work on the length. Again, we're going to want to look at what part of our lid we want. This comes down into a nice point, so I'm going to leave more of this up here and take more from here to start. And we're going to want to take the measurement of how deep we did here. This was a quarter inch if I remember correctly, uh, but just measure that. And we're going to want to then go from the back of the box to the front plus that quarter inch or whatever yours is, and just have the lid sitting out to about the front of this box here. We're gonna wanna end up doing a lot of nibbling down once we start creating this front piece to get the best fit. Uh, you can get yourself into some trouble if you try to get final dimensions and then realize as you're routing a groove in this front piece, you need a little more. Uh, it's always easier to take away. We're gonna just take it down so that we're right out to the front of this lip and then we're gonna stop there, we're gonna leave it, and we're gonna then go make this front piece. All right, I've got this cut down to the width I want and the length I want to start with. And when I talk about a little movement, I want this to be able to pivot just a little bit. All right, so we've got just, you know, less than an eighth of an inch movement back and forth, but the key really is that it can pivot left and right from front to back so that when this front piece slides in here, if it needs to pivot a little left or a little right, it can. And there are two other things at this step. One, if you make this lid a little oversized to start with and you have a scrap, this is a great piece to keep to test to finish on. Now one thing I noticed when I was fitting this is that as it sat for a couple days while I finished sanding this and I did a few other things, it developed a little cup with these two wings tipping up. Now that's fine. It's really good to know right now what your lid's gonna be like. But one thing I noticed right off the bat, and I've had this happen plenty of times, is that when we're going in, because of that cup, this doesn't want to go in perfectly. There's a little bit of hesitation there. 
So as we go towards the end of making this lid, we're gonna end up putting a slight ramp on this so that when it gets pushed in, it just naturally slides right up in there. So for right now, if it's not going in perfectly without a little downward pressure on the front, or conversely, if you're cupping the other way, a little bit of pressure up, don't worry too much. We can definitely fix that towards the end of this. But for now, just leave this square and as is because sometimes sanding can knock things a little bit out of length. So we're gonna now, look at the front of our piece here and we're gonna hunt through uh, wood we have to try to match this pretty well. So I've got the piece that I really like here. And remember this is sanded and for me this isn't. This is just from the really skip planing at the lumber yard. So it's hard to see exactly the color match. But I have a good feeling that this is gonna fit well. We've got some of these dark pieces in there and this kind of lighter silver and this red. This is a piece of cherry. So I'm gonna be looking at this section right here. now. I'm gonna run this through the planer uh, to get it down to thickness here. So for me, that means unfortunately, I'm gonna have to cut off 11 or so inches to safely run it through the planer. You can do this on the table saw as well. So identify what you wanna use. And I highly suggest getting two pieces out of this because there's a chance you're gonna screw up on your cuts. You're gonna have one, two, short or one you know too short this way or this way and it's really nice to have a backup piece instead of having to go back through this entire process so identify your piece get it milled up to how you want and we'll go from there now to mill this we're going to want to try to get the thickness of this front piece here because we'd like to get pretty close with the thickness of this wood whether you're doing it on the planer the table saw or somehow sanding it down or router uh, sledding it down, but we want to leave a little extra. So for me, I'm going to get the calipers out. You can do this with a ruler. Um, either way is fine because you want to leave a tad extra to sand down. You don't have to be perfect. And what I suggest is taking measurements from this side and this side, because if you find a high spot, that's where you need to have your major measurement. So I've got 0 0.845 and 0 0.846 on this side. So my sanding was pretty good. I actually kept these uh, relatively similar. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes you've got uh, a decent difference between the two of these. So I'm going to mill my wood, uh, plant it down to be slightly thicker, so maybe 0.847. Uh, not a ton, but just enough so that if I place it there, I can feel my fingers running over the lip. However, you don't want it so large because when this is being cut at 45, you're going to want the back end to basically sit up against this so you can get a good idea of how far in this goes. So just a hair over, just a little bit over, but not a ton over or else it'll be very hard to get this fit. And the reason we go over instead of trying to get it perfect, and again, if you can get it perfect by all means, but I, uh, I've never been able to get it perfect from the start, is when we cut this piece, we're gonna use sandpaper and we're gonna make sure uh, it's flat and level. We can take some off. Um, you know, we, we fine tune it with the sandpaper at the end. Now, what I suggest as well is making your cut this way slightly higher than this, because again, we will sand that down at the end as well. Um, if you make it under and you don't have any extra wood, you can always sand this down, but if possible, make this piece a little taller. And obviously you wanna start out with a piece a little wider than this so we can cut it down as well. Now that I've milled this down to thickness and I put one straight edge on this, uh, I really don't think it's a bad idea to let this sit overnight. Uh, a lot of wood has a tendency, especially when it's figured or has weird grain, to, you know, move a little bit. You've released pressure by making a cut, and it's quite possible that when I come back tomorrow, there may be a slight bow in this. These edges may be a little different. So really, if you go a little, you know, short and just joint this one edge, I use a table saw jig, uh, and have the time, let it sit. So I let this sit overnight. It's got a little bit of a, a little bit of a bow in there again, enough that I'm gonna run it through this jointing jig again, just to get it nice and flat. Uh, I made this just out of somebody was throwing away a, a bookshelf, I guess, if it was, or a, some kind of storage thing. It's just one of those fiber boards, and uh, it's just my homemade jointing jig. This is a luxury blade, uh, you know, they're not cheap, but if you ever want to treat yourself to something, you know, I'd try one of the Freud blades. So we're just going to run this through, get a flat edge or a flat uh, straight edge on here. I just wanted to give you an up close look at the glue line rip blades uh, final rip here. You will struggle to find a saw mark anywhere in there. And if there is one, uh, it hasn't so far for me affected the glue line. Now, as we begin to get this final piece here, we're going to want to first take this measurement. 
I believe mine was about uh, 15 16 so I'm gonna cut at just an inch for now and again if you can cut two pieces out of the same one that's great if not take a piece of pine or some kind of scrap wood and as we go through make an identical cut so you can test on that one every time before you make the cut on this one so make your height cut um, with your scrap wood check it go through and every time you want to take a little bit off or when we cut these angles do it on your test piece first now that i've got these uh pretty close to where i eventually want to get them i'm going to start looking at the grain here and deciding uh which part of the top i like and which part of the bottom will match closest as when i make the final cut to get it really close to this height i want to take off from the bottom obviously i've got a little burning there um, instead of the top. So when you decide, label your top, label your face, and make sure then you just cut off from the side uh, that will be facing down. That way you keep the best flow. Now that we've got our pieces about the right height here, just a slight hair above, we've looked at this and we've determined, okay, what part of this is going to look best on here? And, you know, pick one for each of them, or if you only have one piece, that's fine. And we're going to just do a rough cross cut to get out uh, the section of this that we want. We don't want to cut the final length here. We're going to do that as we do the miters. So I'd leave, you know, eighth of an inch, quarter inch on either side because sometimes you get tear out and you want to leave yourself a little room to make a second cut there. I put the 60 tooth uh, blade in here, just a Diablo. Uh, the higher the tooth, the better. You're going to get a cleaner cut. I really don't like to sand the miters. I think you have a really high chance of taking them out of the angle if you start sanding away at them. So we're looking for the best finish we can get directly off of here. But leave yourself some extra because sometimes, no matter how good your tools are, you can get a little tear out and it will show on your final product if you're cutting directly to length. So we're now gonna make the miter cuts. And if you have a table saw and you've never gone to the 45 before, uh, and it's on the factory preset, I'd really double check that. I like to use one of these angle gauges um, to get close, but really you can't trust these things all that much. They can get really close. Um, and what I would suggest is that when you tilt the blade and you see 45, let it sit for a few seconds because sometimes they will change a little bit after settling. Uh, get it to 45 and then really make some test cuts. Uh, it doesn't help to get two pieces of wood, cut it straight down the middle, and then take one of them, flip them over, and see if they make a 90 degree angle. The one problem that we can run into is that when our box glue up was not a perfect 45 degrees. So what we have to accept is that either we can hunt perfection and try to find this exact angle with a bevel gauge and match that, or we can accept that there's gonna be a slight line perhaps on one of these sides. You know, no matter what, these are almost perfect 45s here, but you can still see obviously where the wood grain changes. So don't obsess over finding this exact angle. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna identify on these which area looks best. We're gonna first just cut one side off at 45, and then we will go through and nibble away at the other side. So decide which one you want to be, uh, essentially an area you want, because then we'll just take off from the other side. I like to cut then my workpiece on the right. Uh, older table saw blades sometimes tilted into the right, in which case I would cut it this way. I want that off cut, which can sometimes get trapped under there on the other side of my body. And one of the reasons I like the miter gauge a lot too, uh, instead of necessarily a cross cut sled, is that I can literally push the workpiece off my table. Prior to making the cut, we're gonna take our pieces, you know, we've identified where we want, and just for remembering purposes, we just need to put a rough line of which direction it goes so that when we're on the saw, you know, if we've forgotten, we know which way to have this up. We'll come back uh, after we make the first cut to get a measurement for how uh, we want the second cut. All right, now we're ready to make our cuts. And what I suggest is you've got a main piece and ideally a test piece. Label the main piece. You do not want to be making all of your first cuts on the main piece. You want to get it correct with your test piece and then make your main piece cuts because we're going to be cutting off this side and then we'll flip it around to do this side. We're always cutting off uh, this way. We, you know, we want to match our blade here. So for the very first cut, uh, it's quite possible you're going to get tear out with some woods. Here. And what I use to minimize that is a little piece of blue tape on the end. And I'd say, you know, it's 90% effective. Some woods are just prone to tear out. Some are really, you know, some individual pieces 
So I'm holding it up there and I'm just gonna really put that piece on there and I like to even wrap it around the edge just a little bit. That's gonna give some support to our last fiber there as the saw blade comes out. I also like to only raise this so that maybe half a tooth is above the wood because what I really want is as this is coming through, I want it coming through the wood instead of down. If it's going down, there's more likelihood, in my experience at least, that it's gonna pull it out. If it's just coming through, coming through, coming through, it seems to produce less tear out. Now that may be a trial and error, that may be this blade, that may be this saw, um, but that's just what I've come to learn over time. I'm gonna line it up with my line here of where I want to cut. We're gonna use a stop block, and this will help for a couple reasons. Obviously, when we make the final cuts, it'll be great for um, you know, getting the, the exact repeatable cut. But for these, it's nice to have something to put pressure on on all sides so that we don't have to worry about this sliding all the way. So I'm gonna come through, I'm gonna put my piece of blue tape on as I'm holding this up against it. We don't want the blue tape going behind this at all, right? We don't want anything pushing this off of there. And then we're gonna make our cut. <laughs> on our main piece now and if you get any tear out move it over a little bit and take a little more off until you don't this is why we left some meat on each end so that if we do get tear out up until our final cut we can cut a little more off to prevent that now that we've got our one side cut we want to start getting a really close measurement here we're gonna flip it around we're gonna hold this edge up against this here it's easier when you're on the other side of the box um, and then we're gonna mark really close to where we want to go. Just for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to show you what I'm talking about, the tri-square. So I've made my mark going up against here. I've carried that line using a square over to this other side. Now that means I'm going to be cutting from here down. So if you have one of these tri-squares, um, you know, fortunately we've made our initial mark to know which direction we're going. We're going to place that up against the edge and we're just going to go down because we're gonna want our initial saw blade to engage here. We're not engaging on this line here or else we'd be making a cut way out here. So we want the inside of our saw blade facing us to not be over this line at all to start. We want it on this side. It's a little hard to line these up sometimes. Now, if you know on your sled exactly where it's cutting or on your miter gauge, you can then come back knowing where this point is and put a line going up this way. And that will then be your cut line of where you're beginning to cut. As long as you're not crossing this, you should be fine on your initial cut, and then we can nibble away after that. All right, we've got our line marked out here. The saw is off. We're going to come over, put our tooth down until we just start engaging, right about there. We're gonna move this back a little bit, and we're gonna go over, and again, on the inside of this line. Uh, and I'm gonna just start it right about there. I'm gonna move my stop block over. And as always, I am much happier to make this in two or three passes than to try to get in one go and overshoot and have to go through the whole process again. Now I've got probably uh, a little under a sixteenth of an inch to remove here. And as we go along to check, we're gonna keep putting this up and it should be sliding further and further back in as we get to the right length. All right, now that half the battle is over of getting these 45 degrees cut, we're gonna now cut a groove in the back of these. We're essentially gonna do what we did here. However, uh, the way I like to do this is not to try to exactly match these. Uh, I find that the best way to get that gap to disappear is to have the lid itself uh, using gravity to pull down on this. So if you remember from earlier, we did everything we could to get the front areas of this lip, or front areas of this lid resting on these two pieces here, which means that we're gonna go through and we're gonna mark out the insides of these. And we're gonna just put a general mark at the opening and closing as a start. But the way we're gonna do it is we're, and I'll get you in closer here in a minute, we're going to make our initial mark slightly higher than this. 
because when we want that lid to close, we actually want the lid sitting a hair off of these bottoms so that it's using gravity to push this down flat and it can't be raising up. Um, now what that means, and this may be why some people may not like this, is that as you close this, you're gonna have to pull this up just a hair. Now some of that can be mitigated by putting a, a bit of a round over on the back here. I generally don't do that, but I have done it a few times and that will make it ride easier. Uh, I've, I've not seen any significant wear opening and closing these when it sits down a bit. Okay, so I'm gonna take my test piece here because that's the one I like to mark on. And we're gonna have the side we want up, up. And we're gonna hold it here. And remember, we want to feed into the router with the bottom side facing in because with each cut we wanna go up because our, our uh, most important setting is the very bottom side of this groove. You know, we're gonna be making a groove across here somewhere. Um, and so we're gonna to wanna to go in, and again, this may be hard to see, and we're gonna mark, we're gonna ride our pencil on the inside there, mark there, and we'll mark the top out, though that's not super important. I've got two lines, I hope you can see that, right there. And that's gonna be our initial uh, starting guideline. So when we set up the router, um, we're gonna actually set it a little above this line here, because when we, when we finish this bottom cut, we actually want it sitting just a hair above where these are. We don't want it perfectly level there, or at least I don't generally, in my opinion. Uh, I want it a hair above that. Now I'm going to be doing this groove on the router as I did with these. However, you can absolutely do these on the table saw if you're doing a mitered box. If you are doing them on the table saw, just, you know, if you have any blade with a rake or tooth in it or have a totally flat top grind blade, do that. However, if you don't, you can still do this with a totally alternating bevel uh, blade. You're just going to lose some of the end grain glue surface, which isn't the biggest deal because that's not our strongest glue surface. However, you know, any little bit we can, uh, can get helps. But you'll have to remember that as you are setting the height uh, as you go in there, that the alternating tooth bevel teeth will stick in a little deeper. So your final depth is going to be, you're gonna set the saw blade a little higher than your actual depth you want because you're not gonna be able to rest on those the end of where that groove is because you'll have little ridges there. Off camera, I've extended these lines out a bit with just using, a, well, I used an ink marking thing, but a marking gauge, a square, or whatever. And I'm gonna lower this back down to just, just a little bit out, maybe a 64th um, showing. And that way when we make the initial first uh, part of a pass. We can just go a little ways, touch it just a little ways in, pull it back out and see where we're at without going super deep on our first pass. Just take a very light little bit of a pass into here, see if it lines up well with your lines. Remember we want to be a little bit above this black line here and uh, then if it looks good just take that in a full pass. Um, this is your test piece so then do your main piece the same. All right, so I ended up making my cut, uh, did a 64th, and then when I got what I liked, uh, I took down to, a, or up to a 16th, and I'm just slightly above. And so we're gonna leave our router or table saw, set it here, and we're gonna do our depth of cut now. Uh, at a minimum, I would do a quarter inch. Sometimes I go up to three eighths of an inch. I'll probably do three eighths here. Remember, we've got very little glue surface. The more we can create, the better. Uh, we don't want to weaken this and one thing you got to be uh, Sure about is that if this part here up top is very thin You have to take it in slow little bites now I'm still gonna take this probably in a sixteenth at a time uh, but You have to be very careful not to break this off if the room that's matching on this lid lip section here is very thin All right, so I'm done with my first run through I ended up taking this to about seven sixteenths because this is such a thick piece of wood We're almost at seven eighths um, might be able to go a little further, but I'm not really looking to push it because this is eventually going to get, you know, relatively thin up there. Uh, the softer the wood, the less I would push it with the depth. Um, you know, five sixteenths, I would say is the minimum I'd feel comfortable doing, uh, to get enough glue surface. I'm pretty sure I've done a quarter inch at times when I cut my lid too short. But 5 sixteenths to 3 eighths is probably optimal. Obviously, sometimes your box is going to be an extremely small box, and that's just not going to be doable. Um, but as deep as you can while still preserving the structural integrity of this. 
So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our lid and we're gonna see where we're at here. Now it's easiest to put it on the side like this, rest it up against the bottom and see, okay, how far up do we really have to go here? So I'm looking at probably about a 16th of an inch that I've gotta go up. So I'm gonna move this fence backwards. We wanna go cut up into this. So we're gonna go backwards. Uh, a little less than a 16th. We don't want to, you know, try to get it on our first go because if we go too big, you know, that's a little unfortunate. It's going to be a little sloppy. Uh, so I'm going to go a little less than a 16th backward. And the reason we start bottom up and go into that is because the router bit spins this way. And you always want the part being cut to be on the outside. You never want to trap the part being cut on the inside. Uh, ask me how I know that. I have an idea of how far using placing this up against here and don't go all that way, but just go partially that way. And then I'm gonna lower this back down a 32nd or a 16th. Basically, I'm gonna take a pass, no more than a 16th. I'm gonna stick this lid up there and I'm gonna see if it fits. If it fits pretty well, we move the bit and we go deeper and deeper and deeper. And then we see how it is with the full fit there. If it doesn't fit, then we push the fence back a little more and we go towards there. But basically you wanna get this so that we're at, after our first pass or so here, a pretty tight fit. One that you have to really push it in uh, to get it in. Obviously you don't wanna ram it. Uh, so we just, we'll get a sense of how hard. And then we'll do a final pass a little bit further back. So we make sure we have a really clean edge here and um, that will get us our final uh, width. All right, I've got both my test piece and my main all done here. I took my final pass. And the reason I suggest doing this in small passes and raising it up a bit by bit is that I've had times where the, the breakout end of this has just gotten totally chunked out. And you know, you work uh, this hard to get this thing nice and mitered, flat, you got that whole thing. When that happens, especially on the top side, that's just a real, you know, it's a real pain. So I've got it now so that my lid Slides in there pretty nicely. That's not going anywhere. This lid is sanded um, essentially to the final grit though. Before I end up gluing that in, I'm gonna take one more pass, very light, quick pass with 320 on this. Um, I've got a little scratch mark here and there, but we don't wanna take a ton off from the lip that's going inside of here or else uh, it's gonna be too loose. And now we are gonna cut this down to size. The way this works on mitered boxes is that we're measuring from the inside of this corner here. So make a little mark right there. I'm gonna be taking this off of the back, but just for the purposes, I'll show you the front here. And we're gonna then measure our depth. So if I remember correctly, 7 sixteenths. Yes. So then I'm gonna take a mark, I'm gonna mark it at a little over 7 sixteenths. I take this, and I'm gonna transfer this to the back of my lid. And we're just gonna use a combination square to do this, or if you you know, just wanna take a ruler and guess it. But again, cut over. Uh, so we'll shave that off, see how it fits, and we'll keep shaving it down until when we have the lid fully pressed in there, we can slide it in, and this matches up, and we're seated nicely. Now at this point, you may, if you have a cup of some sort, be having an issue with this easily sliding in. And I have a little bit of one right there, just a little pressure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get, you can either get you know, a block plane or I'm gonna take a random orbit sander and we're just gonna put a little ramp here, I guess I, I call it a ramp, so that when it goes in, it rides up nice and smoothly. Uh, and we're just gonna round that over a little bit I wouldn't use a router bit or anything and risk tearing this out. You can do this by hand. Just put a little ramp on it until it slides in nicely. All right, I've got my lid cut down to size. I've got my lip on there. Uh, I'm super happy with this. This is still a bit proud. So now we'll go into sanding this, but uh, I'm very happy with how this went. Uh, and one of the reasons we leave this a little loose on the front is that when we put glue on there, it's very hard to perfectly align it ahead of time. So when you push it in, you can, if it's a little loose, you can slide this around to really perfectly align that in the center. 
Uh, and then the other reason we leave a little room here is if when you glue it up, you don't get it perfectly aligned, it will center itself by twisting the lid left or right a little bit, which is why we leave these little uh, extra spaces so that it's all self-aligning. And then the radius I put on the back to ride up, it's very tiny, um, but just enough so that, you know, before it was hitting a bit, now we go in, there's nothing. It doesn't hit at all. Uh, it's perfectly smooth in and out. And the reason we use the, I guess I'll call it the, the sitting gravity method is that, and that forces this down so that there's no big gap there. If you are getting a gap, you are going to need, if the, when you close this, you're getting a gap on the bottom, you're going to either need to sand this down a little bit, which may be the easier method if it's very small, or take more off of this top side. You need more room to allow your lid to sit up higher inside of this. So if you're getting a gap, start off by just sanding this down a little bit. Um, and then if, if it's a really big gap, you're probably gonna need to take more off of this. At this point now that we've got this front lip cut and everything's fitting well, I generally like to take the box inside the house and let it sit overnight. Obviously this kind of box is going to be an inside box and I wanna know how things rest overnight. You know, sometimes this front part gets a little tight and uh, doesn't sit as well. Other times the lid may move a bit, you may get a little lift and I think it's better to have it sitting in its environment so that you can uh, come back to it before you glue up. However, if you want to glue up right here, right now, uh, if you think you've got a good fit, uh, by all means, go for it. Just know that you may have to do some kind of sanding on the lid bottom later or the top to uh, correct for any movement that may happen after it sits in your house for a little while. So now that I've let this sit inside overnight, I'm really happy with how it still stayed down. So we're going to do a few things to prep this before glue and a few notes on finishing. The first is that I'm going to go through and just do a 320 random orbit sander uh, over this to remove a few pencil marks and to just get a nice nice final sanding because once this is glued on, there's a couple issues. One, it's very hard to get up against this with a sander and if you try to hand sand it, you'll oftentimes be scratching this in the wrong direction. Now this is also important to note for finishing. I'm just going to end up using a linseed oil for this. However, if you plan on using polyurethane, shellac, any of that, I highly suggest taking this right now and putting a piece of blue tape on here and doing all of your finishing for this lid before you glue it on. It's very hard when you, especially if you're brushing on, it's not too bad when you spray, but if you're brushing it on, you'll often get buildup in here, even with um, tongue oils, Linseed oil is the only one that doesn't seem to have any kind of buildup in this area. If you're spraying on, you're fine. However, there are some other complications with that. But for the most part, if you are brushing or wiping on any kind of finish that will be sticky and can uh, pool or, you know, drip marks or anything that can harden, I really suggest taping off the portion that's going to be glued in there and finishing it. I often finish the whole box and then glue this up and then put a final spray coat of whatever my finish is on there. The second thing to take note of when finishing is that, especially if you're gonna spray this, when you have this closed, you'll often get a, um, a build up here, but not one that can necessarily be seen, but you will, you will stick your lid. It can sometimes be very hard to get it undone. I made this mistake the first time I sprayed shellac. Uh, it, it stuck, I had to really yank on this thing to get it out, and I was a little worried. Uh, so what I do, is I, I keep it together like so, I spray it, and I make sure that this is elevated on something, and I just give it a slight bump so that I can get the lid just a slight bump. And it'll be sitting on something, so my hand won't be doing this, and then I just pull it out from here, and then just get the lid off, come from underneath, like that. Now you will not have it sticking anymore. You have to be careful doing this, but it works that way. One problem with trying to spray or do build up a finish with this glued on and this out of here is that if you start building up finish on the insides of these anywhere, it will no longer sit perfectly flat. You'll either have to come back and scrape it off or chisel it off or sand it off. But every time you attack these areas, you risk uh, ruining the way they sit up against one another. So think about your finish ahead of time before you glue this on. 
and you know any kind of oil that's a wipe off that doesn't build up a layer like a tongue oil is fine to do with it all together linseed oil totally fine but if you're going to wipe or brush on any kind of polyurethane or shellac or lacquer wiping or brushing do it before you glue this up if you're going to spray make sure you have a way to get this lid out of there without touching any of the faces right after you spray especially if you're going to do multiple coats if you are finishing this with uh, you know a polyurethane or something be very careful when you do these areas not to drip anything down into here uh, Sometimes if I am doing a shellac or polyurethane I do the inside with the linseed oil including inside of here and then I will tape it off after that is all dried I will tape it off before I brush or spray or anything on this That's more of a, a layer buildup because when you start messing with anywhere the lid rests including this area, this is very important do not get any buildup of finish other than a penetrating oil on this area as well. And this is another reason why if you spray, you can't really do it with the lid out because you will start building up a finish here. You can try to tape this off and that can work, but you know, you sometimes you then struggle to get the finish sprayed on up to the line. It's a, it's a bit of a pain, but if you build up finish here, it will not sit flat on that, which kind of undermines the entire purpose of going through this whole process to get it to sit flat. So really think about how you're gonna finish this before you glue this up. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the glue obviously inside of here. I don't like to spread it on this. We'll have this lid sitting here, but not all the way in, just slightly out. We're gonna put our glue in here and be very careful not to put too much because when it presses up against there, it will squeeze out the side and you can accidentally glue your lid onto these front parts. So we're going to put glue in there and we're going to really make sure that we have the right amount that's not going to squeeze out. If you do it on the top too much, it will squeeze out onto your lid and then you'll have a place where finish might not be able to penetrate. You can get a wet towel and try to wipe it off quickly. Um, sometimes that works okay. So we're going to put the glue on there and then we're going to move our lid back slowly into place. And this is why it comes into play where we don't want this super tight. We want it to be able to move a little bit. As we put the glue on, you may not have this perfectly lined up, you can see, so let's say I have it like that, we've got a bigger gap here than there. But if you have a little bit of movement, you push this in and it automatically seats itself. You're going to then hold it, make sure the lid is pushed all the way in there, make sure you're lined up here on the front. On the sides, this is the most important area, and then I like to let it dry sitting in here. After about 10 minutes though, I will slowly pull this out and check and really make sure I have no glue on these inside areas. Trust me, it will glue itself together and you will not be able to get it off. You'll have to cut it off and turn it into a, a hinge box. So just really pay attention to how much glue you're putting in here. And I usually let it sit overnight. I initially wasn't gonna show the glue up, but I figured then if I'm making this entire video, I might as well show this. And you know, there have been times when I've watched videos and somebody says, don't put too much glue and you're sitting there going, what does that even mean? Um, so I'm just going to show this for the sake of that. Uh, if you don't want to see this, then this is essentially the process is over other than the sanding after this. One thing I'm going to also do because I sanded this is I'm going to wipe it with a little uh, mineral spirits just to get any dust off of there. We'll let that dry and then I'm going to blow this out. If you have any kind of like um, feathery uh, uh, wood grain from the router or the saw blade, it's not a bad idea to take a chisel in there. And sometimes on certain woods, especially like maple, I'll take 180 grit sandpaper or 150 and just gently rub it on there. Um, I've heard people say that that makes the glue surface better to be slightly abrasive. Um, but for all intents and purposes, I cannot tell you whether that matters. I'm not gonna do it here. So I'm gonna let those dry. We wanna make sure we're all debris out of there. And the other thing we're gonna wanna make sure is debris free. Uh, I took compressed air and blew this, but again, it doesn't really hurt to wipe this. Debris-free, debris and take one last look and make sure you don't have any glue squeeze out sitting in there. And if you do, take the time to chisel that off. You can generally tell by using mineral spirits. If the whole thing darkens uniformly, you don't have any glue there. If there's a lighter spot, something's blocking this from absorbing into the wood and you're gonna have glue there. All right, now that my mineral spirits have dried, and the best way to know for sure that they've dried is to literally just smell it, uh, smell the piece of wood. If you can smell mineral spirits at all, even if you can't see it, it's not fully dried. 
uh, and you need to wait a little longer. For this glue up, I'm just using Type On 3. I've got a little thing uh, to put the glue on if I need to scoop any out. And then this is a little tool from many, many years ago. It's just called a, well, if you just want to search dab stick, uh, that'll find it. But I really like it because it's got a little scooper on it. And if I put too much in there, I can scoop it out. Plus, I can use it to push it up against the sides. And I can make sure, you know, sometimes with a paintbrush, if you're pulling it out, you're going to um, get some on the edges there. And it's okay if it's on this inside edge, but it can't be on this outside edge. If you get any on there, get a piece of paper towel with water and quickly wipe it. However, do not let a bunch of water get down into here. It will make the glue very runny, and it will squeeze out for sure. I'd rather start with less and add more than to have to deal with scooping out a bunch. So I'm going to start my line not right up against this. We do not want it to squeeze out there. And I'm just going to go down. I'm going to just put a solid line and I'm going to stop there from the edge. And I'm going to take this stick and we want to get it on both sides, but do not get it all the way up to the edge of there. When you push that lid in, it will squeeze it uh, and it will come out if you are too close to that edge. But we want to essentially cover as much of the sides. I mean, this is like a mortise and tenon in a sense, right? Um, our glue surfaces are the outsides and the bottom. Obviously, the bottom is going to be the weakest because it will be end grain from the lid. Uh, so I'm looking pretty good there. Just going to make sure it goes up. Again, I'm trying to stay, you know, maybe three sixteenths of an inch away from the outside edge. Keep spreading it around. We don't want any big buildup spots that it can squeeze out. I'm going to add a little more uh, to get up on this side here, I think. So I'm going to add a little more. I'm going to start it in the dead center and then pull it from there. Don't want to let this get too tacky before we uh, try to fit the lid because we may need to shift a little, little bit in there. And if it's too tacky, it's going to stick pretty badly. All right, I'm pretty happy with that up the sides. If you did get too close to this, take a paper towel or a rim, rub it, and then lift out. Don't drag it. Um, all right, now we're going to take our box. If you have a little too much in there, no way to get it out, push it to the bottom. It will be least likely to squeeze out that way. We're going to put our lid in. Make sure you've got your front facing out. We're not going to push it all the way back yet. I'm going to leave it out a little bit. And we're going to do our best from the beginning here to line this up. But we're not likely to be perfect. And we're going to slide into the lid just a little bit. Just a little bit. And then we're going to come in. It's a tight fit. We're going to come in, come in, and we're going to push it to line it up. That's not bad. I'm pretty happy with that. If you need to, if you need to move this at all, first try pushing on the edges. Pushing here and here or here and here. And if it's really not lining up and it's stuck, take it and start pulling it this way. Uh, don't hit on this, uh, these edges here. You will blunt them and it'll take away from your nice mitered fit. One last thing is to make sure, gently push your lid to make sure it's seated all the way. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, I'm pretty happy with that. That's not half bad. You can play around with it for a little while. Uh, eventually, it will get too tacky. It looks like we're seated pretty well there. And then we're gonna do a real quick check here. No glue squeeze out there, no glue squeeze out there. None on top none on the bottom inside so we should be good in terms of having it uh, <laughs> glue itself together uh, if there is glue there uh, I suggest quickly getting a, a chisel and scraping it off as much as you can in worst case scenario put a piece of the thinnest packing tape you have on the inside of this and then shut it now I personally don't clamp this um, I just hold it in place for a good 30 seconds and then I, uh, I just set it inside. Sometimes I'll set it uh, at a slight angle up. Um, but if everything's fitting right, that glue is pretty tacky by now and it's not going anywhere. We're done for now. We'll come back and do a little sanding later to uh, get this all flush. So the lid has been glued on and sat overnight and it's a great fit. However, we do have a little high spot here. So I'm gonna go through now uh, and get rid of this. This is nice and uh, good here. So I'm going to take a small uh, sanding block, start with 180, and just start going in this area with the lid off, but feathering it through. And once we get this knocked down, we'll come back with the 220, do the whole thing, 
and then we're going to very gently hit it all with a 320 grit random orbit sander. Very gently, just quickly to remove any last scratches because we do not want to round over anything at all. So I'm just going to take this off. I've got a little piece of cloth here to brace it up. I don't want any scratches. And we're just going to take a little bit, go down, up, and feather it back every once in a while. And what this will do is it will eventually bring this a little lower, but then when we put our lid lip on to do the final bit, it will be pretty easy to get it in line. One key here is you don't want to start taking away from this area much because this is already fine with the lid. Hitting this high spot right here, feathering it across so we don't have a weird divot. Um, and this will take some time and patience, so just go at it slowly. Okay, so we have just a little bit on the end here. So what I'm going to do is grab a larger sanding block of 220 and just go over this until I start seeing scratches here and on here. Okay, I've got this down to a point now where I can just barely feel it with my finger, but uh, visually you can't really see it, so that's fine. I'm just going to take a the random orbit sander with 320, and you can always do this by hand too, but I find that the random orbit sander <clears throat> really picks up any of the last scratches. And we'll just go through, and again, we're not putting a ton of pressure. We're only taking a few swipes across. And we'll do that to every side, and then we'll go around and do it to the top as well. Hold this lid on tight. And that's all I'm going to do to that side, just that. Just to get the last scratches off, get us pretty close to flush, as close enough as I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy with. We'll do that to every side. All right, now we'll do one last one over the top. We're just hitting the edges here. You gotta really work to control this. We managed to avoid rounding over the edges. We're nice and flush. You're all done. Just uh, apply a finish now. Uh, if you see any scratches on the lid, you can do a little hand sanding. But again, it's very hard to get up into this area, so just be careful with your starting and feathering out. Well, it's about two days later and two coats of linseed oil on and the box is all done now. I may buff another coat of linseed oil on if I think there's anywhere that looks a little dry, but it's almost certainly done from here. Uh, I'm really happy with how it came out and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.